Tonight's guest is Mark Cameron, the author of 14 books, beginning with his 2011 debut, National Security, featuring Special Agent Jericho Quinn. In 2016, Cameron was tapped to take over the Tom Clancy series from Mark Graney. Tomorrow, the third book in that series, Code of Honor, hits bookstores. Mr. Cameron is a retired Chief Deputy U.S. Marshal who spent nearly 30 years in law enforcement. His assignments have taken him from Alaska to Manhattan, Canada to Mexico, and dozens of points in between. He holds a second degree black belt in jujitsu, is a certified scuba diver and man tracking instructor. Originally from Texas, Cameron is an avid sailor and adventure motorcyclist. All right, and we'll welcome Mark Cameron to the show. Good to have you, Mark. Hey, good to be here. Hey, hey. Hey, what's going on, Mark? Welcome, Mark. Happy to be here. Happy to we're be gonna, here. We're going to toast Mark right away. Yeah, Let's might as well. Him. Might as well. When do we not toast people or any other? I'll toast with my Zycam because I'm out of cold. So nice. <laughs> we don't we don't let medication stop us from this. So. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, Talk. Mark, I'm gonna start right in with the question. So tomorrow, with Code of Honor, you have your third Clancy, uh, third book in the Clancy series, and after all the books Tom wrote, and after the books Mark Graney wrote, he's uh, Jack Ryan and John Clark have been in about every mess, enough messes to make James Bond blush. So uh, how do you continue to seek out those stories to put them, you know, in, in harm's way and, uh, and keep it fresh? Tell us about that challenge. You know, that's a really good question. It's a, it's something that I think about all the time when I'm talking with Tom Colgan, the editor, he's, uh, he's good about letting me bounce ideas back and forth off of him. I, uh, you know, I, th I think what, the way I'm taking this and the way Mark took it and, and, and actually the way Tom Clancy did it, it's kind of like our universe, but it's not exactly like the universe we're living in now. So hmm. he, you could see, you know, Russia is a threat or as Clancy did or, or now Russia is a threat or China or, or Iran or North Korea. But at the same time, when Clancy was writing him, we were, um, we were in a shooting war with Japan. We were, you know, we made peace with Iran. We, there, there's, there's things that happen that are kind of different. And so I look at the news. I read, I, I get most of my news after the fact. I don't so much scour social media for news. I, I read The Economist. I read Foreign Affairs. I read, um, you know, the periodicals, that sort of thing. And I just look to see what might be a, a, an issue the, like in the first one um, had to do with human trafficking, a good, uh, good buddy of mine it, with the marshal service is a, a psychologist with the marshal service who works with the Texas department of public safety. And so they developed this program called interdiction for the protection of children where they, it's kind of like um, looking for little tick marks for stopping a drug offender, except these are for kids that, you know, stolen, mm -hmm. um, trafficked kids mostly so i were i kind of worked that into some, you know something that's going on today but maybe maybe doesn't seem like international espionage but can interact with it and then in the last one of office i did uh, i looked at deep fake videos when they were just starting to get noticed a little bit mm -hmm. and now they're all over the news but yeah. it, you know that's right. that's two and a half years ago that i was reading those so. That's causing uh, that's causing a big problem. Yeah. Fake. I know with with, uh, with law enforcement, Secret Service in particular. Um, so so Mark, I I imagine you receive uh, a lot of input from your editor Tom, as well as the estate from Tom Clancy, to any story outline you propose in the Jack Ryan series. So um, can you share with us how you deal with all of that? Yeah, actually, um, that's not the case as far as I, I work directly with a publisher the publisher I'm not sure how much they work with the estate they they um, I know they look at it and give me a yay or a nay but as long as I stay true to the characters I haven't had now this, this could all change if I went off some went off the rail somewhere right <laughs> but as it is now as long as I keep the characters the way Tom Clancy envisioned them or wrote them at least the way I see it um, then everything's been good you know i think sometimes i'll i tend to put a little more humor in than than tom clancy did and so sometimes tom colgan my editor will say you know maybe we shouldn't have them yucking it up quite as much there <laughs> that, that sort of thing and so, it, so i mean i, so I come Tom's from a dry. lawn well i wouldn't say dry i just think he's more uh, 
Are you talking about Clancy or Colgan? <laughs> we, uh, we know Colgan. Uh, yeah, Colgan's a great guy. He's such a good editor to right. work with. Yeah. So open. Um, but he's, you know, he, you know, for good reason, guards that Clancy way. And um, he keeps me honest in that regard. Coming from a law enforcement background, um, I tend to put my, and not, and not a military background, even though my son's in the military, I tend to revert back to tense situations I've been in, and, and almost all of them have had a bit of a chuckle. Even when it, they were deadly, that's sort of a defense mechanism. And so I, I put myself in those, and sometimes maybe it doesn't come across right to an, an editor. So, but, he, but even that, it's, it's minor. We, we uh, go back and forth a lot on the plot, um, and then he kind of leaves me to my own devices while I write it. And then at the end, he'll say, you know, think about this or flesh this out or whatever when I turn in the draft. Um, so it's, it's a good working relationship. He's very easy to work with. Yeah. Pretty cool. So we asked, um, we asked a contemporary of yours, Kyle Mills, uh, this same question uh, just a little while back. And so when you were approached uh, with Tom Clancy uh, series, did you have any uh, preconceived reservations or, or concerns uh, taking over such, you know, arguably the largest franchise and you know in thriller history oh yeah but i had a heart attack i, I think <laughs> i think um i and i and i told tom kogan this later that if i had not been terrified when they called me to offer me the thing he it, i would have been the wrong guy to choose yeah I, I i was uh actually doing research down in florida with my wife for uh, the first arliss cutter novel open and carry and we were when I say research, we were actually on the beach hanging out. But, <laughs> yeah, uh, we, that's we the had best. been, we had, we had been. You guys are all writers, you know. That, but, uh, the IRS that's the best research. <laughs> but uh, I really was. I was down there doing research, but we were having kind of a little day on the beach, and I, um, my wife, I, I got a call, and my wife actually took a picture of it. So somewhere on Facebook, there's a photo of me, kind of with my, my arms folded and the phone to my ear. Just looking uh, kind of <laughs> like a like I'm about to fall out, um, and she I don't know why I think she thought well I'm going to record this moment of Mark hearing somebody's tragic death or I don't know yeah. what it was but she recorded it and, and um, or took a photo of it and it was my agent telling me that Mark Graney had uh, recommended me for the gig but I was I was absolutely terrified because my books sell well and they were paying the bills but and, and Mark Graney to his credit he did not say a word. He took my manuscript and said, Hey brother, I'd like to give you a blurb. How can I have your manuscript? And then, uh, connivingly pass it on to Tom Colgan. To, to look at. <laughs> he's a schemer. He's a schemer, but I owe him, man. He's a good dude. Yeah, he is a good dude. He is. That actually leads right into my question. Cause that actually stole the beginning of my question was Mark Graney actually recommended you for this role, which is true. He did. And that's, uh, that's a pretty cool thing. And he had actually shared, I think with us when we talked with him that he had the same reservations um, when yeah. it was offered to him of, wow, this is, this is bigger than me. Um, was there a piece of advice that Mark gave you um, when he kind of handed off the baton to you for the series? Is there anything that he shared with you um, uh, pros and cons or pitfalls or anything to watch for? Not, not so much pitfalls. He did say that I'd probably hate him by the time it's over, but, <laughs> but um, I don't, not at all. And he, you know, he, I, I can't remember his exact wording when I uh, turned it in. It was about the time my due date was, and he, he uh, sent me a little note saying, you know, it's, it's post-submittal euphoria time. How do you feel? And <laughs> that sort of thing. But I, I uh, as far as, as advice he gave me a ton of advice and I was back and forth with him over um you know email and phone calls and Facebook messenger I mean he was so good about letting me ask this little tiniest details like hmm. what do you, what do you think Jack Ryan Jr's favorite soccer team is what do you, what do you you know describe this character in the way cuz some of the characters like Midas and those folks are are Adam Yao or people that he's developed hmm. and so right I wanted his uh, take on that. So he was, he was very accessible. And this is while he was writing, you know, red metal and his own books. And, uh, yeah. but just a, just a really good guy, just so yeah. easy to work with. And he, and we have a little Bible that we used that Mike Madden and I used that Mark started that, you know, 
Senator Henley or Jerry Henley who comes from here and this is what this person looks like and Adara probably looks like this and I've even gone so far as to ask Mark um, you know like what actress do you think this person looks like or what actor do you think this person looks like and hmm. um, he's very that's helpful. A, that's well, you took cool over two you took over two writers then. Yeah. Oh, yeah, exactly. And and I thought, boy, I'm going to get a lot of hate mail for not being Tom Clancy, but I get just as much for not being Mark Graham. <laughs> <laughs> is, is it from his mom? <laughs> his dogs. I think Lobo sends Yeah, yeah Lobo's dogs. kind of, yeah. So you were, were you 50 when National Security was published? 50 years old? Yep. My first book, I was 40 nine for my okay. first my first thriller i i had written westerns before that I had about okay okay westerns. so i i'm i'm 49 and i'm trying to hit that 50 marker um but what i'm curious about is you've been really prolific in the last nine years really prolific uh, and i'm wondering if that's a reflection of starting late or do you think you would have been that prolific if you had become a novelist you know two decades earlier yeah i think if you had the unfortunate if you were if you were able to look in my sock drawer you'd see that i've been prolific for a long time with old manuscripts it's not mm. necessarily successful but i i've uh i've written my my wife says it's like a like an illness you know that, that i get cranky <laughs> if i'm not writing and um i, I and you probably you guys probably all yeah, have that it, it's same. a it's a it's an odd kind of hubris too you writers have to say i mean I always don't have to, but for me personally, we're, I've ne I never really like the book. Well, I shouldn't say never, rarely. I think there's been one book that I really like when it's done, but most of the time I'm kind of reticent. I just, boy, this, I could probably do better if I had yeah. more time, but, but you need to look at this and you know, I, this is not my best work, but you need to look at this. We, we feel uncomfortable, but we want to push it out on people. And that's just a, that's a, an odd fight for us to, to have to put up for our families to have to put up with. But I've been, I've been writing compulsively since I was a little boy. Wow. Okay. Well, that, that's kind of interesting, Mark, because as, as Sean alluded, you, you're a writing machine. Uh, <laughs> well, in, in, 20, in 2017, you published not one, not two, three books. In 2018, you published a book and a novella. And now you have Tom Clancy, Code of Honor coming out. And as if two series wasn't enough. Earlier this year, you introduced the first book featuring Deputy U.S. Marshal Arliss Cutter. It's impressive. Uh, well, I'm kind of, I'm kind of like dumbstruck by it. Well, um, I, I hate, I don't want to pop the balloon, but but the third book that I'm releasing um, was written about a year ago. So I, I generally write about two books a year. Right. Uh, Kenton held acting measures back for a little bit because of pl you know placing and where it is. So I. Well, that one I, I shouldn't get credit for. Two books a year. Uh, but you, you still are, you sh he's still, you're still a writing machine. Uh, so my question is, do you ever worry about burnout? And, oh. and if so, like, how do you avoid it? You know, I think getting out and, I mean, I worry about it. I worry about everything. That's why I don't have any hair. I, <laughs> I, I, uh, I, uh, I think getting out and meeting people and seeing things and like, like, like Hemingway said, you know, filling that writing well. If if I just sat in the in my office or in front of my fireplace writing, um, I'd probably um, get dry. But I I've said this a, a dozen times before, but I I think writers should be like mollusks, and we, we should really be filtering everything that's going on around us and picking out the the good tidbits to give back to our readers and. You know, so in order to do that, I had to be out. And the book I'm working on now, for instance, is um, an Arliss Cutter. I have to finish it before I start the next Clancy, and it'll be the third Arliss Cutter. And it's set down in Juneau, Alaska. And you know, a lot of times, in re you guys are writers, you know this. The research that turns out the best for us is the the unknown unknowns. You know, we go down right. to research the known unknowns. I want to see what this is like. I want to see what you know HMX one looks like when I want to write about it for the Clancy. I want to go down and uh, look at Juno because I, I want to look at this glacier and some of this stuff. And I happened to be down there and I met a guy that um, he runs a, a website called Juno's Hidden History, and he just he has all these maps and these these graphics on his iPads of all these mines and 
uh, underground tunnels and stuff that I had no idea about. And so that's become a big part of the book that I wouldn't have known had I not gone down there. So I have to get out and live life. And I can do that as long as I don't, you know, writing two books a year sounds, um, I mean, it is a lot of work, but it's not a lot of work if you think of it like a job. If, I mean, I worked a lot of hours as a deputy marshal. Right, right. And, yeah. and if you think of writing as, you know, kicking back on your lot, you know, your yacht, drinking mojitos and writing <laughs> 600 words a day, then two books a year is a lot, is a lot. but Mark Graney treats it like a job. I treat it like a job. So I'm up writing. And while I'm on the plane, I sometimes convince my wife that we need to fly first class because I need more elbow room. <laughs> I don't want to you know, <laughs> space. Um, but I, but I write everywhere. I, I would joke about a good friend of mine who's a deputy and I were traveling somewhere and we dropped off a prisoner and we're deadheading back. And, um, He's a good friend of mine, and he. But I had already been writing. I was. I think national security was out, and I had several westerns. And um, he um, he said, "Man, it must be nice to have all this, you know, this play money and this extra income." And and I wasn't making a lot of money back then. I mean, I, it was like buy a refrigerator or something like that. Yeah, yeah but, um, <laughs> play money. <laughs> yeah, play money or buy a new gun. I think that's what I'd done. I think I just bought a gun. I think I might and, have. Uh, yeah, it's exactly. <laughs> and um, so he was kind of picking at me. How do you, how do you do it? How do you keep this job and do it? And I looked over at him and I, and I was writing, I had my, in fact, I was writing longhand. So I had my notepad out. I looked at him and I said, cause I'm not sitting here playing angry birds. I'm <laughs> right. True. Or, right? or waiting so on the, the plane. And that's Utilizing what it your takes. Time. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Time management. Yeah, Get exactly. Good at it. Sure. Um, so with your background and the fact that you're a retired deputy chief marshal, um, and you know, you write what you know. So your character, Arliss Cutter, of course, is a U.S. Marshal. So how much of your experience and um, maybe some of the uh, uh, things that took place during your career have made it into the books? Oh, a lot. I think, I think um, that's why you'll see that my, my Clancy books tend to have a, a lot of Secret Service or um, FBI or, you know, I mean, we have the military and I do a ton of research with the with the military to get it right rip rip rawlings you guys i don't know if you talked to him yet yeah we know dude, that, he, sure. he um he helps me quite a bit with that but i i know a lot more i've you know been detailed to the, um diplomatic security and work you know work with a lot of different agencies the secret service included and um so i i go back on either my own war stories or or steal the best ones from my friends and, and tweak them and you know, <laughs> the move them around. And I, yeah. I think more than even the, the, um, you know, you know how you, uh, have an argument with somebody or a debate and then you turn and walk away. And as the elevator door shut, you think, ah, I should have said that Whereas uh -huh. a writer, you can go back on scenarios that didn't happen exactly the way you want yeah. and say, if only it had happened this way then and so i do a lot of that too i look back at you know when i arrested this guy i was kind of i was not as safe as i should have been i should have done this and i have my guy look way cooler than i did in real life <laughs> um and but more than any any event i think the people are what i draw on the, the really good men and women that i was able to work alongside and uh with and then um also the the bad guys yeah um I'm only a few years younger than you. Um, and so uh, growing up, I had a steady diet of Clint Eastwood and John Wayne and, you know, all the great, you know, Westerns. So was, was writing Westerns your real first love uh, when you first really started making a, a real serious attempt at writing? You know, just writing a good story. And, and I, I tend to write the kind of people that I'm around. And I, um, so when I was, when I was young, I, I wanted to write like, um, you know, I wanted to write James Bond type books. I wanted to mm. write about, uh, you know, the busted flush and some Rockford esque kind of guy yeah, yeah, yeah. In private eye down in Florida or, you know, so all my early stuff was uh, kind of private eye law enforcement -y kind of thing. Um, but then as I, when I was a young, uh, and I, I wrote a lot of short stories. I wrote a ton of short stories when I was young and uh, on through college and, and then as a young policeman. 
In fact, uh, I tell the story all the time, but I told my wife that I wanted to be a college professor and a drama, a drama teacher and a novelist. And cause I met her in the theater and she um, married me. And then I, you know, I sprung it on her. I don't want to be a cop. So she bought me <laughs> you know, and a novelist. And so that first year we were married, she bought me a Smith Corona typewriter and a uh, bullet- bulletproof vest because the police department that I worked for didn't supply buy them back in 1984 mm. so, um, that's love my friend yeah <laughs> i'm telling you and she um she she's like the perfect novelist cops partner wife but um cool so uh so anyway i wrote i i was a police officer and i got on with i didn't have a lot of money they were paying me like six bucks an hour to be a cop and Jeez. which you know nice. she bought a 400 bullet, bulletproof vest and yeah. a $200 typewriter on that but um I uh, started shoeing horses part time as a I apprentice. I was an apprentice horseshoer and started making a living shoeing a couple of horses a night and five on Saturdays. It was like going to the gym. I was in the best shape of my life. I bet. And um, just was and I doing cowboy day work and things like that for friends. And so westerns just kind of came naturally to me. Yeah. Long long answer to that. No, that's Small that's question. cool though i like to hear that that's the kind of answers we like right? you don't have to think as much you just ask like two questions and you can go on so you you've been a writer for a long time and you, you mentioned that you kind of wanted to write james bond stuff but as you either as you were growing up or as you got into the the career a little bit more full force was there a writer or writers who you kind of used as a model or who at least who you kind of aspired to have some a career that was similar well, the the writer that I most um, studied was Ken Follett. I have all of Ken Follett's books and um, marked up and um, highlighted and and that sort of thing. Um, I um, of course I you know I read the Flemings. I read Robert Ludlum. I read basically anything that had, and I and Frederick Forsyth. I read a, everything Frederick Forsyth wrote as soon as it came out. Um, and then um, Norman McLean, I, I like the lyric, you know, the lyricism in his prose, but really I wasn't trying to be, I had, a, I had a really good teacher that was my mentor and she, she really urged me to study a lot of different writers, but to be myself. I, uh, I read uh, Robert Penn Warren book and tried to copy him uh, called all the King's men and right. uh, have it all noted you know notated and highlighted and i read it when i was a junior in high school and um the 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 uh, english teacher that was uh, i kind of credit for really pushing me into writing or or at least opening the curtain so i could step through into writing she she was such a hard teacher and she i told this story at Bouchercon, but she uh, was such a hard teacher that she gave me horrible grades all the time like because <laughs> i would i would write something in pen when it should have been typed or in pencil when it should have been in pen. And so, and she, I, I thought that I was such a good writer that she should just overlook that, I guess. And, uh, <laughs> um, and I didn't Attention spell very well. Exactly. I didn't have a typewriter until my wife bought me one. I had to, I would have had to go to the, to the lab and I didn't have time for that. I was in plays and drama and had girls to date, but uh, mm-hmm. she, um, Amen. <laughs> she wrote, I, I wrote a short story sort of like a Robert Penn Warren kind of introspective a writer looking at life and that sort of thing. And um, I, I made a C minus on it. She probably should have failed me, but she gave me a C minus. There was red marks all over it. And, uh, but at the top corner in pencil, she wrote, Mark, this looks publishable to me. And it, it, that, that, those little words in the top really changed my life. Yeah. But, but she sat me down and told me after that, uh, um, be you as a writer. Don't be somebody else. So, but study all these guys. So I've, I really, her name's Charlotte Skidmore. She passed away. In fact, one of the books, one of the Jericho books, I think the fourth one is dedicated to her. And I was able to uh, put it in her hand about two months before she died. Wow. And, yeah, fantastic. Uh, but, uh, that's, that's really, really cool. a great teacher. That's really Sounds cool. like an amazing person. Um, yeah, so Mark, when you're crafting your stories, um, do you find it difficult to tread the line between fact and fiction when writing about the means and methods used by law enforcement officers to do the job like skip tracing fugitive tracking i know i got some pushback with the secret service they asked me to not say this and maybe <laughs> reword this um i was wondering if 
how you do that. Yeah. You know, I, I, I just, I think about it. I, you know, with my oldest was an OSI agent for a number of years. I wrote about an OSI agent and, or I still do but with Jericho Quinn, but I write about kind of an over the top OSI agent. When I write about um, police work, my youngest is an Anchorage police officer. And um, I certainly don't want to give away any um, means and methods that aren't out there on the internet or something right. that would get somebody hurt. And as yeah. a deputy, I feel the same way, you know, I think as a, as a chief deputy of being a, a, you know, as one of the designated public information officers, when you're, when you're the chief, you're constantly thinking, all right, before I say this, are they going to be able to clip three words out of it and make me look like an ass, you know, <laughs> and, or, or screw, you know, really screw or edit something together and, and, uh, you know, put this with this with this and figure out what we're doing. And so I, and we had some reality shows on the Marshalls Alaska as well. And <clears throat> pardon me. And so uh, we're very careful with our means and methods. So I, I've kind of gotten in a habit of it at the same time, you want that verisimilitude. So I'll, I'll right. put in, um, you know, little bits and pieces of reality, but generally speaking, there's so much on television now that, that is um, not real. Like, like the way we track cell phones and stuff like that, it it takes a little longer than than um, some shows would would allow. Not two and, or three minutes. And, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, sometimes we can, but but yeah. <laughs> back a long time ago, back along I shouldn't even say a long time ago. Back, um, well, I guess it is a long time ago. <laughs> 15, 15 years ago, when everybody was using pagers. Um, the marshal service was doing a ton of stuff with pagers and I would never talk about that because yeah. it was, it was pretty mm -hmm. sensitive. Now I can go back five years and use a little older technology and, you know, GSM phones and pagers and things like that and put it in. And it sounds high tech to people that don't know about it, but it's 10 year old technology. Yeah, it's, it's old yeah. tech. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah. I got, I got some, uh, some pushback with the secret. I mean, it wasn't, wasn't much, um, certain things and, you know, my defense was, yeah, but you guys just did a National Geographic where you showed yeah. everything. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. No, exactly that. So, Mark, you have a, a second degree black belt in jujitsu. Um, mm -hmm. My son's actually in the martial arts, so I thought that was really cool with your background. Can you kind of maybe tell us or for our audience, can you give an explanation of maybe how um, that background with martial arts, how it influences you, not in law enforcement, but how it influences you as a writer? That, that's a good question. I think jujitsu, uh, Japanese, and as this is not Brazilian jujitsu, this is Japanese jujitsu. Right. Right. Um, I started in um, um, Aikijitsu and Aikido and that sort of thing and learned, mm -hmm. and I love, I love Aikido, but my Aikido instructor pretty quickly told me that as a police officer, this was not going to work very well and no. so he would he we would in we would um work out and, and um my my wife had um this sounds my wife had cancer and she was she's fine now but it was pretty touch and go for a little while and my oldest son was eight at the time and um i could tell he was just getting really stressed out and so we yeah. took aikido together and so we would go every you know a couple of times a week and really kind of get let him get loose and and uh, the, he's the one that's then the air force now but um so we did a lot of aikido together but the i i i've always liked a little harsher art a little more destructive art a little more that you know things that you could use in law enforcement and, and mm. battle yeah um and so the my sensei would come over and say well you do this. Don't, don't do it like the rest of them. You do this. And I, and I just realized he was teaching me Aikijitsu instead of Aikido. And then I have a very close um, friend. He's really more like a brother who's, uh, he just got his 10th degree Jeez. in, in uh, Jiu-Jitsu. So he's got his own school now, but his, his name's Ty Cunningham. He was my partner with the martial service for a number of years. And he's been my sensei for over 20 years, like 25 years now. Wow. And um, he, uh, so, so we've come up together, we've fought together, we've, we've fought alongside one another. He's saved my life a couple of times at, at work. I, um, he's just a, a good instructor. And so I, you know, I, I tend to quote him a lot. And I, even when I do fight scenes now in a book, um, I will call him on the phone and, and say, 
what do you think about this? What do you think about that? Because, uh, you know, you're, you've been involved in martial arts, probably most of you, at least one level or another. And, and the higher you get in martial arts is, until you get to Thai's level is the 10th degree. You really, the more you learn, you don't know. Right, right exactly. Uh, so as a second degree black belt, I can teach, but I, I also know what is, what does Miyagi say? You know, best defense, no be there. I, um, <laughs> I don't, when I go to Dallas and walk around the West end of <clears throat> voucher con or walk around, uh, with my editor at voucher con in new Orleans or something as a second degree black belt, I know strategically this place is, I don't want to go because, yeah, uh -huh. you know, we, we have that saying, um, it's a old Chinese proverb. Uh, when two tigers fight, one is injured beyond repair and mm -hmm. the other one is dead. And so <laughs> in, in a real fight and um, even in a law enforcement fight, which generally just means somebody trying to get away and you're trying to stop them. But sometimes those turn into the person turning around and actually, you know, going to guns with you. Um, it's, you mostly go home hurt. You go home with a, mm -hmm. you know, a cracked rib or, you know, pee and blood because you I mean, probably the worst I was ever hurt was kicked into the edge of a metal, um, like a prep table at a restaurant and got into a big knockdown drag out with a guy. And it could have broken my back, but I had on a ballistic vest. And so I had that padding over my kidneys. Oh, yeah. The corner of it hit my kidneys. So I was, you know, pee and blood for several days and feeling pretty sad about life. But, uh, <laughs> um, he, I got him. I mean, I won the fight. Yeah, you won. <laughs> you know, I won. That was awesome. Um, you, so, U.S. Marshals, man, the yeah. most dangerous, the most dangerous law yeah. enforcement agency. Yeah, yeah. 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 So it, you know, it was like it was like Thriller Writer One Hundred and One, though. It was awesome. I would uh, quiz my prisoners, and they, you know, they knew I was a writer. And I mean, I, mean, I wasn't like saying buy my book, but uh, <laughs> they, uh, not a lot of readers. They uh, they didn't even know my you know we don't tell prisoners our names except, oh. you know, yeah. so um, don't show them where we carry our weapons. I, I always get a kick out of people that show all their carry stuff and all that online. Cause I, uh, you don't get to know where I carry my gun. That's not your <laughs> business. Um, you might, if you must know I carry, but you don't need to know where I carry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But that's um, the truth. The, uh, so, so I guess in, in, uh, short answer to your question about jujitsu i jujitsu means the pliant way and so i have to be strategic i have to think where not to go where to go so i'm very strategic in the way i write and i'm very strategic in the way i, I want my characters my uh, characters to think the good ones and the bad ones always looking at this avenue or that avenue yeah. so i use jujitsu a lot in in the writing the, the mindset anyway right well, I've got a second degree myself. And so in my last book, I found myself in the same situation with you, like trying to incorporate that. But when I was a blue belt, I felt on top of the world, like I could like take on a, an entire gang. And I started getting toward brown belt. And I'm thinking probably not a good idea to even attempt to do that sort of stuff. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Well, if you have a good sensei, they'll, uh, or Ty's a, a master now as a, as a 10th degree. But if you have a good master or sensei, they will certainly bring you uh, down to reality uh, kicks in pretty to, soon. Yeah. Uh, you start so, to get too. <laughs> when, uh, you know, when people are born and bred in Texas, you don't usually find those folks uh, venturing outside too much, um, you know, out, outside of where they were born. Um, and usually there's a pretty damn good reason when they're not there anymore. So um, was the state not big enough for you or did you feel like maybe living closer to the frontier, uh, was more to your liking? How did that, uh, did that you know, I, I love Texas. I love the people in Texas. I still have family in Texas, but I've just always wanted to go North. I, I read a book when I was gosh, 10 by Farley Mowat called two against the North about hmm. two boys that get lost in the barren lands in Canada. And, and I, I went out, um, went out in our backyard and cut a piece of cottonwood root and made myself some, some uh, Inuit snow goggles and uh, <laughs> wore, wore those around in Texas to the chagrin of my parents. <laughs> but, um, but I, I just always wanted to go North. I remember going to the Fort Worth fat stock show with my parents and uh, there was somebody from the Yukon territory there. I don't know why, but they were uh, kind of promoting, um, and, um, tourism i guess in northern canada and so i got a canadian map and started looking at 
you know, different canoe trips and things. I was, I've always been one for adventure and, you know, going on trips and uh, plan some out. And then uh, Alaska just seemed like the, like a good fit for my personality. And, and mm. we've been here about 20, 21 years now. Yeah. That's no, beautiful, man. I, I was, I got to go up there um, during the 08 campaign because I was assigned to uh, Sarah Palin's detail. Oh yeah. And, uh, so I was up there in um, Anchorage and Wasilla and all the, all the other folks on my, on my shift on my detail were from the South. And so when we arrived, it was like October and the snow was going sideways already. And so they're like, Albany's, you, you're from the north. You drive, and I'm like, I'm from New yeah. Jersey. <laughs> Jersey. Jersey. Like this? That's, That's like Michigan. <laughs> yeah, you probably worked with, with with Nick Hefner then, didn't you? Did you the oh, Secret you, Service? Do you know Nick Hefner? Up here? Very well. He's a good All friend right. of mine. Cool stuff. <laughs> cool stuff. Good friend of mine. Small I'll world. check you out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So nothing Mark, but bad, nothing but bad things about me. You're good. <laughs> Me too. Me too. With the 30 years of long enforcement experience and, you know, utilizing that as, as you write now, um, is there something that you want to tell us that other writers get wrong, whether it be with the marshal service or in other forms of law enforcement, what's commonly gotten wrong with people, maybe people without like myself, I have a finance background, so I probably get everything wrong, but I know there's guys out there that were law enforcement that right now, write. But is there a common thing or, or something that jumps out that they get wrong? You know, I, I guess there are a few things. I, I'm not very picky about that sort of thing. It's a, a lot of people will jump on folks for saying clip instead of magazine or mm -hmm. whatever. I just write a good story. And I, I mean, that's fine. I, I get, I guess the thing about the marshal service is, um, uh, Marshall spelled with one L, and so I, I got a I've got a buddy in the the FBI, and and he always spells it with two L's, so I spell federal with two L's whenever I'm writing out FBI. Um, um, and the Marshall Service handles witness secure, you know, witness protection, not the bureau, but that's that's kind of become more well known now with some different movies and and stuff. Um, you know, in this day and age, I think that um, oh, I guess the thing that tactically not necessarily a, a law enforcement thing but uh well law enforcement i guess it seems like on every movie now every television show to look cool on uh on screen they chamber around before they go in and i i just picture a, a loose round on the ground if I side every time i went into a door um as far as writing goes, I think most people, at least the people I read, try really hard to get uh, to get it right. I get a lot of phone calls from people asking me questions, and cool. uh, yeah, I think you know, Marshall with one L. Um, <laughs> Otherwise, it's a department store. I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I don't have a, I don't, or the guy that works for the fire department. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I right. don't. Uh, I don't have a lot to whine about. I guess. <laughs> I would say Tommy Lee Jones has probably been one of the most famous marshals that's graced the screen. Listen up, ladies and gentlemen. Our fugitive has been on the run for 90 minutes. And uh, I'm just talking about Boy Scouts. So we went last year with the troop up to Fontana Dam where they filmed where they filmed it. So it was really cool. I was like, guys, this isn't a movie. And, you know, and explaining to them, of course, these kids are, you know, weren't even born really when the movie came out but it was it was fun so when did I they give you the did they give you the tommy jones line i don't care that's, line. that's the best <laughs> line ever and i didn't kill my wife i don't care i didn't kill my wife i don't care yeah we we that's that's sort of the that you are in a position that i was in when i started the marshal service with true grit because true grit was the most famous you know, Rooster Cogburn was right. the most famous marshal to grace the screen when I came aboard. And mm -hmm. I had a I had a, a female deputy supervisor that worked for me when I was chief. And I, I called her baby sister for about six months. And finally, <laughs> she looked at me and she goes, why do you keep calling me baby sister? And I said, true grit. And she said, I have never seen it. Uh -huh. Think about himself once in a while, baby sister. We'll get your man. That's the main thing. What? And uh, I said, all right, that's your assignment. I was probably, I'd, I'd get fired if I did it, but if she didn't, we were friends. But um, I assigned her to go home and watch True Grit on her <laughs> off hours. <laughs> training, training video. 
<laughs> but yeah, Tommy Lee Jones, um, and now of course Justified with uh, yeah Ray uh, Givens, and I wish it I wish it were that uh, exciting, <laughs> that glamorous. <laughs> that show had sometimes it is. That show had the best group of antagonists of any series. That oh I can my even goodness! Think of. Yes. Oh yeah. Tremendous. And some of the best writing. I mean, the showrunners oh, yeah. for that. I mean, they had the. What would Elmore do? Sign above their their writing room, and um, it showed. Oh yeah, they just did fantastic. Hey, I think, so uh, I think more I coming. Pay a little homage to him in the in the open carry. I pay a little homage oh. to oh, oh Raylan. Good for that one, though. That's pretty cool. Uh, going full circle back to Code of Honor. Um, what would you think? What would you say was the the funnest part, or the the part you found most enjoyment out of writing that story? Um. Probably going around with the military. I, I really enjoyed, uh, I uh, got to ride with uh, the Marines at Miramar in an in a Osprey and a young captain there kind of took me through what they would do during, uh, if they were going to let Marines fast rope out the back and what she would do when she took off from a big deck, you know, um, how you know the things she would say she walked me through the whole thing and that's that's really fun for me to be able to talk to the individual uh marine soldiers sailors airmen whatever and get to know their backstory um i got to tour uh hmx1 marine one chatted with them and and i met one of the crew chiefs and um in fact it's kind of a neat thing when you're writing a, a book like this pardon me when you're writing a book like this especially a clancy book you really get into the some of the weeds a little bit the interesting weeds hopefully right. but you do get into the weeds about some of the technology but really it's it's a, a people over machines and what we want to know is about the the man or woman that's that's flying that or driving that or you know pushing that button or whatever and so uh in this particular book i started off thinking about um talking about the hmx1 pilot the you know the helicopter pilots that fly marine one and uh ended up writing about the crew chief because that you know that young man that, that i talked to and that i eventually sort of picked and tweaked the character around they got a heck of a lot of responsibility for 23 year old yeah, 24 no year old it's an, it's so it's kind of neat thing, to yeah. focus on that right yeah so so really the the, the best thing about writing uh the Clancy's because, and, and my Jericho books as well, because I get to do some military stuff with them, but the, the Clancy's open so many doors. The best thing is, is meeting these young men and women that are, they're just incredible. Right. That, best, that actually leads into a question. We asked uh, Mark Graney on here when we were talking about his Clancy period outside of Jack Ryan, what is the character that you most enjoy writing in that series? John Clark. No that doubt. was his answer too. Yeah. It's my you know, favorite yeah. character to love, read. Mr. Clark. Yeah. We all love it. Yeah, I think I identify with Clark because I'm getting old and I uh, <laughs> my elbows hurt and I find <laughs> shooting a I find shooting a single action much easier mm -hmm. than shooting a double action and um, I you know I like I told somebody the other day to quote Toby Keith I'm as good once as I ever was. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but but you know i'll go home hurt but he's i i uh somebody asked me in a recent interview uh or they had read the book to review it and they said they noticed that there was a lot of grandfatherly advice in the book i, I don't know if there's a lot but um clark is definitely feeling his his age emotionally as well as physically and i i you know i'm not much of a crier in fact when you read the arliss um cutter books he talks about his grandfather named grumpy um, because he doesn't smile very much and cutter doesn't smile very much either. And I, you know, I don't know if you've noticed, but I don't smile very much either. My foe, my face just doesn't go that way. I have to, <laughs> and then it looks, it just looks creepy. It looks yeah. Like, Santa Claus. Uh, yeah. yeah, exactly. A little, my bit, a little bit. Exactly. <laughs> kind of creepy barbarian Santa Claus, but I, um, you can't put in what God left out. So I, I'm just here, but I, um, <laughs> I feel that kind of that solemnness um, mm -hmm. along with the look. And I think Clark has that. I think Arliss has that. And, but I've noticed as I got, I've gotten older that it, 
dad gum I get weepy sometimes and I and my my little kids will do my a good example my wife was reading Charlotte's Web to my grandkids in Michigan a couple of weeks ago and uh, my wife started to cry when she got to the end and mm. you know you, you remember the the last line of Charlotte's Web does anybody know what it is no. I always I always uh, share the first line because it's one of the best first lines in fiction ever when I'm teaching people how to write because you ought to always start with uh, a mystery, right? And the first line of Charlotte's Web is, where's Papa going with that ax? Well, that's, <laughs> that's a cool first line, right? I mean, there's yeah, all kinds thriller of- Thriller first line. Yeah. Papa, ax, oh my gosh. <laughs> um, you know, ask Fern as she helped her mom set the table. But the very last line is just as good or better. And, it, and it's when, I don't want to wreck it for any of your viewers, but Charlotte died. <laughs> and, spoiler alert. And spoiler alert. And I may be messing up a word or two, but basically it's from Wilbur's point of view. And he said, it's not very often that you find someone that's a very good friend and a very good writer when he's talking huh. about Charlotte. Yeah. And uh, she just started to cry and I started to cry. And so I, I, uh, con I mean, not like boohoo, but I got tears right. Yeah. Right, so much so that my, my, granddaughter was like rubbing my face um oh, sweet. so i um i put a little bit out in clark i in fact in power and empire i have him get a little uh, misty eyed when he's watching his uh, grandson play ball mm -hmm. uh, so it's it's pretty cool that they age that the characters yeah. actually you know they're aging yeah yeah that makes them real I'm I'm a six five, two hundred fifty pound crybaby, so I'm not gonna be judgmental about that at all. Uh, I, uh, He's cried yeah. twice during this interview, Mark. I, I, yeah. I step away. Oh, uh, it's the underwear. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've you've survived the the main portion of the uh, interview, but um, this is where it gets tough. This is yeah. called the lightning round. And um, dun, dun, dun. As, as I've explained before, our moms always say, "Think before you speak." This is where we ask you to speak before you think. And um, this is where we upset all the mothers and yet get some of the best content the show's ever had. Yeah. All right. All right. A huge I'm buckled bar. in. I'm buckled in. So right. I will start out. I have five questions for you. The first one is you, you live in Alaska. Have you ever wrestled a bear? Negative. Wow. Mm. <laughs> Still the only one here. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess that's not true. I've wrestled some out of a, out of a, uh, down back down to the boat when we're going to eat them oh yeah <laughs> i don't know if you oh, want to okay. put that in your book they weren't fighting back at that point <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> all right and the next question is can i call you uncle mark <laughs> you, you can you may okay all right awesome all right. okay who is a better jack ryan alec baldwin harrison ford or ben affleck <laughs> oh jeez harrison ford yeah yeah please I, thank you you know what i i'm i'm a i'm not an alec baldwin guy in any way other than i think he was when I watched that movie, I thought that's the guy I pictured in my head. And no, I he, Alec, Alec Baldwin did a really good job. You know, you know who I, this is lightning round, so maybe I shouldn't talk, but no, go ahead. Who, go ahead. who I picture when I write um, is sort of a cross between Harrison Ford and Tim Daly. Uh, right. um, yeah. I have that. So Tim Daly looks kind of like an older Alec Baldwin, maybe you could say, but he yeah. has Jack Ryan, but uh, in Madam Secretary, that, that really good, um, just that ethics professor kind of yeah. a very right, right, smart right. guy. That's I. I don't necessarily picture Tim Daly, but I picture that kind of a person. Gotcha. Interesting. Hmm, that's kind of cool. Okay, who is the better Cameron? James Cameron, <laughs> Kurt Cameron, Kurt Cameron, <laughs> former UK <laughs> Prime Minister David Cameron, or Pearl Jam drummer Matt Cameron. <laughs> Uh, I'm gonna go with Sean Cameron. Yay! Wow. Uh, all right. I, I what a kiss favorite up, show <laughs> ever. <laughs> <laughs> right, my last done. question. My last question, not yours, is so we just had Alex DeMille on the show um, talking about the deserter that he wrote with uh, Nelson DeMille, right. and it got me thinking. DeMille, DeMille, are you up for written by Mark Cameron and Sean Cameron? <laughs> <laughs> let me think about that no yeah. <laughs> no great not, answer. Not, at no. Time. not at this time he, he needs four years uh, he's still got to retire on that yeah. one okay, we'll get back to you <laughs> all right so now my turn so mark you and your team 
have a no knock warrant and you're stacked up outside the house. Where are you in that stack? Probably number two. Number two. Mm -hmm. uh, can you can you tell the guys what the number two guy does? Get shot. There you go. To walk in sandbag. <laughs> <laughs> He's a good boss. He's st sticking a bullet for his guys. Uh, um, so the U.S. Marshals have the honor of being the oldest U uh, federal U.S. law enforcement agency. Uh, U.S. Postal inspectors are not. So they are. But do you know who the number two is? Um, Secret Service? Let's go with I, that answer. That's a great answer. I, I, I don't, I don't know. Service. I don't know. Um, so uh, neither do I. Um, I, I <laughs> That's why he was asking. <laughs> U.S. US Customs claims to be sometimes the oldest because they were formed before the marshals, but they weren't a law enforcement agency at that right, point. Right, right. Oh. And then the post office tries to get involved. or the postal yeah, inspectors. Yeah, it doesn't count. But the FBI, just so everybody knows, was created by the Secret Service. Mm -hmm. Just want to put that out there. They didn't want and to do the work. Don, that's for Don Bentley. If he's <laughs> watching. Also a good dude. I think yeah. Don heard that a few times. Don still has to. Don has a chance to rebut that when he comes. Yeah, in. he'll be on. Um, but I will stick that in his this finger in his eye every time I. <laughs> um, so, which was the better movie? Wyatt Earp with Kevin Costner and Dennis Quaid and Gene Hackman or Tombstone with Kurt Tombstone. Russell, Val Kilmer, and Sam Elliott. Uh, Tombstone. All Tombstone's the best movie ever. Absolutely. Yeah, Tombstone, yeah, was, yeah. Yeah, Tombstone was awesome. Val, Val Kilmer alone makes that trip. I didn't think you had it in you. I'm your huckleberry. That's, that's my number one movie of all time. Is it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's a, it's, a it's, a good, it's a good mustache movie, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's <laughs> great stashes. Um, Eric Bishop is a fugitive on the run. True. Always. There's, there's, uh, there should be a red dot on your forehead. Right now. <laughs> so, so, Mark, how long would you? How long do you think it would take for you to get him into custody? There'll there'll be a knock at his door at any moment. I've, I've got him I was a, I was waiting for him to say before you finish that question. We already got him. Yeah, not long. Not long. Uh, Thanks, and so my Mark, last I question. The vote of confidence. So uh, since, since we all like Mark Graney, I think we all think he's a great guy. Uh, who's a better shot, you or him? Oh, probably him. I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, you know I, try, I try to keep my shots like this. Right. He's probably like this, but this, this will suffice. It's good enough. Whatever works. <laughs> right. As long as you're not putting it over the person's shoulder. Yeah, good. <laughs> yeah. You can move this all around. and <laughs> Still works. Five fast. Points. I go for fast. All right. Looks like I'm, I'm up. On a scale of 10 to infinity, how crazy are Alaskan bush pilots? Um, probably just below infinity. Pretty, pretty crazy. <laughs> yeah. Smart crazy. Very smart crazy. But, Very in, yeah. Oh, yeah. I've, I've flown with some. I flew with a trooper pilot um, named Earl Samuelson that's one of the most uh, just incredible, just absolutely incredible. He'll fly, and if he thinks somebody needs saving – He'll uh, he'll fly into blizzards to save their life. Did you see the Dude. one where the bear chewed up the whole plane? The guy took a bunch of duct yeah, tape, duct and put, tape. It all, yeah. put it all back together again and flew it at home. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, that's they're, true. They're incredible. And and you know, from a from a guy that uh, gets picked up by those bush pilots, it is it's just the most amazing sound in the world when you're out somewhere and you have got a bad guy, you know, handcuffed to a four wheeler or whatever, and you're waiting. And it's cloudy and it's snowy and, and, you know, not blizzard conditions, but pretty crappy. And you hear that plane coming through the fog and then it breaks through the fog and lands. And, oh, it's, uh, we, uh, we owe a lot to those guys, men yeah. and women both. Pretty cool. All right. You're out in the bush. Would you rather carry a 10 millimeter semi-auto or a 44 wheel gun? I carry, they're, they're both good. I have friends that carry a 10 semi-auto, but I carry a, a 44. I carry a, uh, really, I carry a uh, Remington uh, TAC-14 <laughs> in a little wow. thing with a little short. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Uh, I carry, the whole time I was in the Marshalls when I was out, I carried a, uh, that same gun. We just called it a Witsec shotgun, but it's a 14-inch barrel. Actually, I think the Witsec one's a 12-inch barrel. Um, it's got a little tab on the front of it so you don't, you know, like muzzle your hand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
out of the Remington TAC 14, but I carry a, a, a Smith and Wesson model 29, um, three inch 44. Oof. Call What's it, the kick like on that? It's, it's ported. It's called a, it's called a trail boss. It's oh. a little rounded butt ported. It's a, it's a good gun. Carry it in a little, <laughs> carry it in a little shoulder or a little chest. Little shoulder rig. Yeah. That'll yeah. Work. It, in fact, that, that, that's the only gun anybody ever sees me with online. Cause I wear it when I'm fishing and yeah, you're right. out in the open. Right. All right. The last time you cried during a movie. I can't think of a time I cried during a movie. I don't we're, just, we're just talking about crying. Come no, on. I cry. I cry. <laughs> the, the Little Mermaid. Maybe. <laughs> Toy Story. You know, if, if I had to watch where the red fern grows right now, I'd cry. Um, uh. I don't. Uh, oh, no, no. I remember. I remember when it was. With my wife and I go to the Cook Islands every year for, for a couple of months to write. And we were leaving the Cook Islands. And um, we had gotten bumped up to first class, which is amazing for an 8,000 mile nice. flight yeah and uh, so i was laying down so nobody saw me so i was in a little cubicle thing yeah yeah yeah. i thought i'll see what movies are on i was so sad to leave where i because you have so many friends there and moana came on and i cried i don't you know i, don't, I think it was more about leaving the crib yeah the, the beginning of up cry. the beginning of up i know it's yeah rock rock made me cry oh up yeah yeah, yeah up definitely uh, about okay. coco how about that? This is all Didn't animated movies. Coco you know, Coco <laughs> also, Coco could make me get teary eyed. I watched yeah. that with my kids, uh, uh, my grandkids uh, a couple of uh, years Watch ago. Watch it with my kids. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. You guys, you guys caught me. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a crier. <laughs> all right. Over your illustrious uh, police career, who was the dignitary that you enjoyed working with the most? I protected many justices probably um sandra day o'connor would be up high yeah that's cool um, uh justice alito i i really um and not not comparing politics or anything he's no. just a, a very smart guy and um i really enjoyed that protection detail um several district judges but i don't know if you would call them dignitaries and then i uh I protected the foreign minister of uh, Japan several years ago. I can't remember his name, but he was just a super nice guy. I was mm -hmm. detailed to the Department of State Diplomatic Security and was part of that detail because I uh, spoke some Japanese. And so um, I enjoyed that. But I, I think the, the Supremes, I, I enjoyed, I've enjoyed every um, opportunity I've, I've had to protect Supreme Court justices. Uh, chief Justice Roberts, I, I was on his detail, but I was chief, and so I was not um, like yeah. right on the detail, but I got to interact with him and, and that sort of thing. Cool, all pretty right. cool experiences. Nothing like nothing like the Secret Service, though. I mean, they, mm. they you know, kind yeah, of, they have all the fun. Yeah, they do. They do. <laughs> we do we get all the nice little toys, uh, but it's <laughs> it's executive protection work. So I mean, you yeah. get it. You carry luggage. <laughs> yeah, right? yeah. yeah, you can get it. <laughs> all right, my last question. The scariest situation you ever found yourself in while researching for a book? Boy, I, I, um, I got run over. I didn't get run over, but I got a, an RV. I was riding my motorcycle down uh, from Alaska down to Texas, and a big RV stopped in the road ahead of me. So I stopped, and um, I... Uh, waited he didn't go anywhere he didn't go anywhere and he kind of pulled over to the right and his blinker was on like he was going to get back on the highway but he pulled to the right and i waited behind him waited. i'm a pretty tentative rider you know very careful yeah and we were out in the middle of nowhere i mean we were out in the middle of nowhere yukon no other cars around us or anything and he looked out the window like go around and so i built up some speed to go around and right when i got up next to him he pulled out in front Ugh. pulled out in front of me so i was going not too fast maybe 30 um but i tried to you know that i i've heard riders say you know i had to lay the bike down well I, you don't ever try to lay no. the bike down you <laughs> try to avoid it yeah but the bike laid down i didn't try but the bike uh -huh. i tried to take the ditch and the bike went down but luckily it was a it was a low side which means the bike went ahead of me i didn't have to worry about a you know 800 pounds of right 
smashing me in the head. Ooh. But I remember, and, and that whole trip, every time I would ride, I was usually writing a, a Jericho book because he's a writer too. And um, so I consider that trip research. And um, I remember <laughs> bouncing, bouncing down the road on my back because I'm a, I'm a AT, you know, an ATG, ATT guy, all the gear all the time. Yeah. So I had, you know, full armor and all that on. So I'm bouncing down the road, my bike's skidding around in front of me. I saw it sort of bounce into the, ditch and um i remember thinking um this is going to be cool in a book <laughs> um, silver dude, lining so you you ride you rode all the way from alaska all the way down to texas yeah about uh five times dang man dude that's awesome yeah, yeah. Based it's, on your earlier beach comment, I thought you were going to say, "Hey, one time I waded out into the to my knees, and there was a three foot swell." And there was a yeah, really exactly. It was horrible. It was actually horrible. <laughs> I got a mad bad mai tai one time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you're up. I am up. Okay, so Mr. Cameron, sailing or riding your BMW motorcycle? Oh, that's not even fair. I, I know. know. Sorry. Uh, probably riding, although sailing's a uh, very close and the older i get sailing more i just uh enjoy the comforts of uh, going down below to a cabin <laughs> and relax i get more riding done when i'm sailing absolutely but, because when i ride i generally get up about 5 30 or 6 in the morning get on the road camp i'm camped by two and then i write that afternoon okay mm, nice but sailing's pretty awesome too so you're alone in the Alaskan wilderness, probably something that's happened quite a few times. Would you rather have a run-in with a moose or a bear? A bear. A bear. Yeah. yeah I, I've heard nasty. bad stories about mooses. I, I always thought, <laughs> no, you'd, you'd want to run into a moose, not a bear. And everyone's always said, no. <laughs> no, no, you're absolutely right. Moose or, you know, I don't want to have a run-in with either one of them, but no. bears, will, bears will generally run away. When a moose comes after you, they're coming after you. They're coming, yeah. Yeah. They're so big, man. They have no <laughs> idea. Unless you've seen one, they are huge. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They are very big. A friend of mine got his rifle broken by a, by a moose, cracked some ribs, and the moose Jeez. snapped Dude. his rifle right in half. Oh. Sarah, Palin, Sarah Palin's uh, uh, our follow up or our limo. We almost ran into one. He was crossing the highway. Oh, that'll and kill you. As, as we're motorcading. Whew. Yep. Yeah, because they're, they're so the right tall. height. <clears throat> You're like hitting a horse. They just yeah. roll right yeah. into the right across the hood. Oh, yeah. and, and it didn't care who was up. You know, we're driving on the hunt. Did not care. Nope. <laughs> nope. Moseying nope. across. Nope. <laughs> so my next question: Who is the uh, living author you have not met yet that you'd like to sit down and have an adult beverage with? The living author who I met, Ken Follett. Um, Wow, probably cool. Ken Follett. I'd like to check out with him. Well, cool. Maybe, Maybe that will have a ton of books here. Yeah, <clears throat> you might not like this one either. I got another comparison one. Uh, <laughs> would you rather be scuba diving or hunting? Mm. Oh, as I get older, probably hunting because it's more social. I hunt with my youngest son, and mm -hmm. yeah. that's some of the best. In fact, I. I basically go hunting with my youngest son and he takes the meat and I just glory in the fact of sitting in a, you know, on the tundra by a big, the only rock there with my youngest son and chatting with him for hours and hours and hours yeah. while we look at the beauty and yeah. Um, Dedicated so, time. Yeah. Pretty yeah. Cool. You, you realize how precious time is and that time yeah, with him, I'm sure it's just amazing. I'm jealous of that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so my final question, and I ask this one a lot, the guys give me grief for it, but what is on Mark Cameron's pizza? Yeah. Um, pepperoni and mushroom. I guess. Yeah, not, that's it. That's, that's not, perfect. Uh, yeah, not, my wife is a pineapple person. Oh, no. no, I, no I can't no. do that. I can't. No. A, yeah. <laughs> pepperoni I got and pizza mushroom. in the other room. It's got there pepperoni go. on it. Fax me some. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want this pizza he's from, from virginia. virginia there's no pizza it's, you don't there. want this pizza <laughs> I, I asked my son the other day i said did you get a did you get a fax or a teletype on that uh bad guy that's coming up through here and he said no because this is not 2001 we don't get 
<laughs> well, Mark, Tell you have story. you have survived the crew reviews. Um, Sweet. congratulations. You know, we, we have a pretty high mortality rate, so congratulations. <laughs> um, but we appreciate your time. Appreciate you coming on the show. And um really excited for Code of Honor to come out tomorrow. Nice. Um, so we were raising a glass to Code of Honor and Cheers. Mark Cameron. All right. Cheers. Cheers for the opportunity. Reviews. Really, thanks a lot. This is awesome. No, that's yeah. great. Thanks for what you guys are doing for the industry. I mean, my goodness, you're you're really doing a great service and – that's great. Right. You're, you're very easy to chat with. You, you're, you're good at what you do. Oh, good. Well, that was that's the intent little... all along. So yeah, that's yeah, the plan. I want to once again, thank Mark Cameron for coming on the crew reviews tonight. If you would like not one, but two signed copies of Mark Cameron books, one in the Jericho Quinn series and one in the Tom Clancy series, subscribe to our YouTube channel, leave a comment, and like us on Facebook. Have a great night. We are going to toast to another great show. Crew reviews, Mark Cameron. Cheers. To Mark. Well done, to boys. Mark. Nice job. Okay. Three, two, one. Go. All now, your the, the absurdity happens without you. All yeah. right. Well, let me know when it comes out. I'm, I'm happy to. I'll. I'll Toot it or tweet it or whatever. Out there. Absolutely. Do both. <laughs> Tonight's guest is nope. Mark Cameron. Nope. I had to get a blooper out of it. Sorry. Oh, okay. No. <laughs> that wasn't a blooper. You didn't I know. Bloop. I had to make one. Sorry. Uh, you didn't do it. <laughs> All right. Let's go again. Two. One. Tonight's guest is Mark Cameron, the author of 14 books, beginning in 19. Uh huh. <laughs> Self induced. <laughs> 720 you gotta leave <laughs> yeah. what? 11 I, I minutes was, to pull this thing i was so dialed in until chris started me. screwing me <laughs> mr cameron <laughs> <laughs> why do i, I just, write these long intros i could just see it coming too <laughs> me too oh it's beautiful paragraph yeah just go to the second paragraph and i'll you sure I'll do, I'll do some yeah. magic okay. Yeah, okay. Okay. we'll be here all night <laughs> thanks for your confidence <laughs> one in the Tom Clancy series and one in the Jericho Quinn series. Please like us on Facebook. Four minutes. Here we go. Three. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> Please like us on Facebook. And that's not what I want to say. I want to once again, thank our guest, Mark Cameron for coming on the crew reviews tonight. We had a blast with Mark and we know you guys will enjoy this show. And that's not, I don't want, I don't know why I'm ad-libbing. How many minutes? Two, Two and a half. Okay. Here we go. Here, I, I got you. Thanks for coming on the show, Mark. Take care. <laughs> <laughs> to subscribe to our YouTube channel. No. Leave a comment. No. What else? <laughs> Do whatever you want. I don't care. Shut on my driveway. Mm. Jeez. Mm. It's been a while well, since I've closed the show. Let me tight something up real quick. <laughs> you, we don't have time. <laughs> Please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Leave a comment and retweet anything we tweet. Anything. Doesn't matter. <laughs> I actually like kids that. pictures. That was anything. That was good. Where are your kids going to be left in a few minutes, Mike? Where are where are they exactly? Oh, they're walking now. <laughs> Why am I talking about Twitter? I don't even care. Screw Twitter. No Golden's Twitter. a safe area. They're fine. Want <laughs> to once again thank our guest Mark Cameron for coming on the crew reviews tonight. Had a great time with Mr. Cameron. Yep. Want to once again. <laughs> All right. Three, two, I got this. I want to thank Mark Cameron for coming on the crew reviews tonight. Had a great time with Mr. Cameron talking. <laughs> why do I, why do I, why am I doing that? I don't even know. It's like a mental block. Out of beer. Have a drink. I'm going to drink for you. I want to once again thank Mark Cameron for coming on the crew reviews tonight. If you would like to win not one, but two copies, two signed yeah, copies. I do. They're signed. I do. <laughs> I do want to win them. How do I get one? Yeah, where do we go? Where? What site should I go to? Yeah, right. do it right now. Tell Can us. Me... All good questions. All good questions. <laughs> Enjoyed talking to you. <laughs> <laughs> well done. <laughs> Another beautiful show, gentlemen. Well done. I always oh. enjoy the time with you. You guys uh, are my best friends, by the way. Oh, eat your cold pizza. <laughs> best friends. Mm. Good freaking grief. <laughs> Thank you.